And we are live. Welcome back, Jimmy and Brian, with you guys. Day two, getting ready. First and foremost, happy Mother's Day to everybody. And thank you for spending some of your Mother's Day with us for Sin Sinister CyberCon Day two. We've got a fun day two uh, today, Brian, for everybody. Lots of cool content going on both uh, some very cool guests and some cool artist demonstrations yeah absolutely i mean day one we had a hell of a time uh lots of great guests there uh interaction from you the fans has been wonderful we appreciate that uh day two we have a stacked stacked let me say it one more time stacked group of individuals and artists that are going to be uh gracing the screen uh during this uh time of uh shelter in place so uh, we hope that you uh, enjoy it. Please bring your comments, your questions. Uh, you know, keep it keep it fun and light for everybody as well. And remember that um, just because uh, we're not face to face doesn't mean that we're not all in this together. And uh, also, be kind. Be kind to each other. Be kind in the chat room. Be kind to individuals. We don't know what everyone's going through. So just enjoy yourself. And to all your mothers out there, thank you so much. Because it wasn't for mothers, we wouldn't be able to uh, sit here right now. Because who would put us here on earth, right? So uh, thank you so much. Uh, Jimmy, I'm stoked for this first guest. And I'm not going to lie. I'm a little uh, little uh, jelly that, that you're going to be talking to him. But I got to talk to him for a little bit. So I got my fix. So that's cool. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to you, Jimmy. Uh, do your thing, brother. And All I'll right, see you guys you. around 1 o'clock. Later. All right. So there you go. Thank you, guys. Welcome to day two. And our first guest kicking things off. I think everybody uh, knows this man's work, who is a fan of Sinister uh, Creature Con, now Sinister Cybercon. Um, it is an anthem of work that, uh, as any 80s horror fan goes, you listen to this thing about 10 dozen times throughout the year. But Killer Clowns from Outer Space composer John Masari is our first guest on day two. John, how you doing, man? I'm doing very good on this Mother's Day, and happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. <laughs> so man like i said when i introduced you the killer clowns from outer space soundtrack you got like bits and pieces from like all different kinds of music that come together to create these themes mm -hmm. you got everything from like the dun 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 dun, dun, dun to mm -hmm. the like the like almost imperial the killer clown march that mm -hmm. dun dun like how much fun was it to sit down and get to create the score to this thing? Oh my goodness. I, I was like, it was like a dream come true. Cause you got to understand. I, uh, my love for film music started when I was a little kid. Um, okay. I went to my first uh, triple feature. Uh, it was the time machine, mysterious Island and journey to the center of the earth. And I, I didn't realize till, a little bit after that, it was the music that was left such a great impression on me. And uh, when I got the opportunity to audition for this movie, and I was at the screening at Warner Brothers Studio, seeing the movie without any music, with practically no sound effects and just dialogue, it was so creepy and so bizarre. And it was like, it was a dream come true. It was, yeah. I'm not kidding you. And uh, previous to that, I had seen a movie by uh, Danny Elfman's brother, Richard Elfman. It was called The Forbidden Zone. And when I saw that movie at a festival, I thought to myself, I, I need to see this movie again because I don't really understand it, but I like it. I, I, whatever I experienced was so interesting and bizarre. And that's what I felt about Killer Clowns from Outer Space. And so the approach that I took was like a serious approach, uh, like if I was you know, scoring, instead of making it goofy, I don't think it would have, the music is the straight man, basically. So right. if I had a goofy, goofy score that was like silly and not really take it, didn't take it serious, um, uh, I don't think it would have played well. And right. uh, the Killer Brothers were very adamant, you know, they, they told me all the films that they really loved at that time, uh, uh, you know, through when they were growing up, you know, all the classic big, um, uh, event films that were of the day that had great legitimate scores. And they didn't tell us to do a legitimate score when they 
when we auditioned. Everyone said, here's the, no, no direction whatsoever. Everyone said, just pick a scene and uh, you audition with that. And so the scene that I picked is when the, um, when Mike and Demi, Debbie first come to the tent, the circus mm -hmm. tent, and they get chased around in, inside the spaceship and then they run out and the clowns converge on, uh, uh, th that's where the killer clown march comes. And I figured that's a keystone moment, that whole musically and story-wise, it basically sets up the movie very well for the for the rest of the movie. So that's the scene that I picked. It was very challenging. It took about, about a week to do. And um, it was, every every aspect of working on this film was absolutely fun. I would jump out of bed at six o'clock in the morning and then go go to sleep at around 11.30 midnight. And that, that, that went on for six months, excuse me, six weeks. So uh, it was a lot of fun. Well, there's a question from one of our viewers. Uh, Dawson Beavers wants to know how did you compose the the Clown March? So that that song in particular, what was kind of like your inspiration for the uh, Killer Clown March when you sat down for that one? Well, that's a thank you for that question very much. Uh, that is a dear, near and dear piece to me because that piece of music was actually written many years before when I was in high school. And I was in a band and we played Kiss, Blue Oyster Cult, Led Zeppelin, uh, uh, you know, um, Black Sabbath. And we decided we were going to start doing our own music. So I kind of came, I came up with that killer clown march way back then although it wasn't i don't know it wasn't called anything and my band thought it sounded too jazzy you know yeah. we can't play jazz we're playing hard rock it's kind of jazzy i go well you know yeah. but anyways so that didn't work out. so when i saw the movie i said this is now that music now has a home you know so it's a good example for people who create things just because you create something people don't understand it that doesn't mean you ignore it and put it away well you keep it to the side but there's going to be a place for whatever you create at some point and when you consider how lucky we are today that you're able to perform your music and put it on venues like youtube soundcloud uh, itunes cd baby there's like there's no excuse for not doing your music yeah. and think think uh, th think of this there was a time of uh, there's a composer I'm studying, I'm, I'm reacquainting myself with, that's Anton Bruckner. There were symphonies of his that he had never heard in his lifetime. As a matter of fact, his sixth symphony, he had never heard, really heard it performed its, in its entirety. He, the, uh, 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 an orchestra ran through just a few uh, movements of it, and that's all he had. He had there was no recording equipment back then. And um, his, that, that symphony wasn't played in its entirety till after his death. But what did he do? He didn't stop writing a symphony. He wrote another three symphonies. So, um, so what? What I would say to people that are creating, give you encouragement to, you know, keep your work. But maybe people won't understand it. That's okay. Keep creating, and maybe that piece that people didn't understand will be understood at some time in the future. Yeah. No. For sure. I think that uh, the key really is to not uh stop once you kind of start like once yes. the ball keep, once the ball begins rolling yeah. uh, um don't don't try to get too sideline um, right and persistence is you know if you do it every day even if it's a little bit uh, right it all adds up yeah so which one man when you sat down everybody has a favorite mm-hmm which one, uh, which clown kind of caught your heart first? Uh, there's, t well, first of all, they all terrified me. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't until like everything, you know, you started to hear more dialogue replacement and you started to hear more sound effects that the movie kind of comes to life, you know. Right. Um, movie is in, is in stages. Uh, we had no names for any of the, the clowns. Mm. Um, really except for clownzilla maybe shorty you know yeah. had a name but we didn't the it's the clowns came to life really because of the fans the fans mm -hmm. brought the clowns to life they they've given them names they've given them uh you know uh, uh made them real basically but my right. favorite i have two actually um 
One is Shorty, and there's a specific reason why Shorty is very significant. And then Rudy, because Rudy is like, I, I think he's bright, he's resourceful, uh, he, he's like the cutest of the clowns of, you know, he's the almost like the least, you know, he's the tall, goofy, friendly guy, you know. Right. Um, so but then Shorty kind of it, it is kind of like a representation of a disenfranchised person, someone that feels left out, someone right. that is kind of looked down upon. And Shorty could be a child, a, a, a baby a killer clown, could even be a girl or a boy. We don't know. Right. Um, but that's not important. The point is, is that uh, it's assumed because someone's short and someone's little and sweet and has a funny little bike that can be picked on. And then, uh, you know, the shorty, uh, you know, demonstrates that uh, he can't be pushed into a corner and he will fight back once once confronted to a, to a, a point where it's intolerable. So yeah. uh, so anyways, that, that's a very deep analysis of it. But uh, but still, uh, you know that's those are my two favorites. Um, the thing with uh, Shorty too is, I mean, they all have their personalities. Like you, right. they uh, they all have their distinct minors from everything from the big guy in the play yard in the fast food uh, playground when he does his little wave mm -hmm. to. Uh, Shorty, when he stands up to the the bikers, the infamous right. "you gotta knock my block off" scene. Uh, <laughs> they all have that, that undertone, that mm -hmm -hmm sound right, right. Them that gives them the uh, the personality. Mm -hmm. Did you have anything to do with with the sound of each little guy's like kind of undertone at all? No, that would be um, Chuck Serino did all the sound design and I think he helped cre create the clown voices uh -huh. uh, along with the Kyoto brothers and that was really cool because if you uh, like I have listened to some of the dialogue tracks separately yeah. without any sound effects or music over them the clown language is really something worth uh, pursuing is for right. you know like there's Klingon, and yeah. I don't know what you would call the clown language, you know, because uh, the plant, the planet that they, the world that they come from, is probably basically unpronounceable, and <laughs> their yeah. language is uh, equally so. But uh, it's really, um, it's really charming in that way that uh, they, they, uh, that Chuck was very innovative with his sound effects, and I, I must, say, I must confess that even the highest end blu-ray restoration does not have all the sound effects properly blended in uh that chuck created because our original mix our original master um right. well you know there were tracks that were just left out because of time there was no time to balance them out properly so they kind of had to cherry pick what they were going to use so whatever master that finally mix master that's after that that's what's been restored mm -hmm. but uh boy there be it's be wonderful one day to go back into the full tracks and bring them back to life and uh, who knows maybe accentuate them in some way uh, there was someone that can I, may i point out a question someone asked me about a particular mm -hmm. track on my new album the, uh, a guy, uh, someone named Dawson Beavers. Uh -huh. Yes. How did you compose? Tell me what is real. Tell me what is real is the uh -huh. last yes. cut on both soundtracks, uh, the uh, original soundtrack and the reimagined. And uh, uh, the uh, basically, I wrote it with a friend of mine, uh, Larry Getz. And I, he said, "What do you want the lyrics to be about?" And so I told him the story about, about my grandmother. I said, I wanted it to be about my grandmother. Uh, and they go, and so I told the story about my grandmother when she came here to the United States. And uh, uh, basically she, she worked in a factory and, you know, and how uh, someone who's young doesn't yet speak the language, how they get betrayed and uh, lied to. And, you know, she was, she was in a factory as a child working right, in a right. garment factory for, you know, 12 hours a day. And like, she would just, you know, and she's very rugged. My, both my grandparents, very rugged people. And uh, they talked about it, but they didn't 
it wasn't like that was their pride that, oh, I got taken advantage of. She was like, listen, I got taken advantage of, and here's what you do not to be taken advantage of. Um, right. So in other words, it's not like, woe is me. It's like, boy, I got through that. So yeah. that's what that story, that's the story behind the lyrics of Tell Me What Is Real. And I think yeah. you're the, one of the first uh, people I've revealed that to. Um. He also, Dawson, he has a question that I can tell you. Uh, everybody on our side of things will say yes, absolutely. Does this film make you scared of cotton candy? No. <laughs> no? It not, even me, in, not, it doesn't make me scared of cotton candy, no. Not even uh, in the uh, Halloween Horror Night sense. Uh, we follow you on Instagram. You go yeah. to the, the uh, maze. So you went through it. You right, smelled right. it. You walked right, right. through it. Not even after that. Well, I mean, someone that is in a cotton candy cocoon, that would be scary. But yeah. I, I'll, it's not going to, you know, for the uh, once every two years when I eat some cotton candy, it's not going to, uh, uh, it's not going to discourage me. Yeah. Um, so what is it about, man, with, with music in your opinion? Because coming from... Uh, trying to put film together and edit mm -hmm. music adds so much with so little to mm -hmm. especially a, a scary movie mm -hmm. having just done uh my last student film and mm -hmm. having to go through submit like your rough cuts and then your fine cut and then your your musical edit um it's crazy how like a joke becomes funnier to me. It's crazy how like a dark hallway becomes scarier. It's mm -hmm. it really is a trip. What is it in your mind from the musical sense? Is it with composing a, and underlaying the music that kind of creates the creates the package? Well, uh, understand. Or I mean, maybe there are some new filmmakers out there that are watching this also that the whole process is the whole process of making a film is um, uh, <clears throat> is collaborative and evolutionary. In other words, things are going to evolve. You may have envisioned things a very particular way, but then all of a sudden as you start working on it, you start making adjustments and uh, twi little twists and turns that gets you to your final destination. But uh, it's uh, you have to embrace that, I would say. And, um, you know, as far as music, it's the same thing. Um, once we, you, you start out with a basic concept. I mean, the way I like to direct musicians that perform for me, just like I like to be directed by a good director, is that they give me uh, like a, a, an emotional um, uh, uh, bearing of where they're going. You know, I've worked with uh, directors that over explain things and then you get start getting lost or they do worse, which in my opinion, where they temp track, over temp track music into their films because they want to make their cuts work. Because And sometimes it's necessary because they're trying to get a distribution deal and they want to make the film appear as you know, set the pacing enough where a distributor will pick it up. And then they get married to that uh, uh, temp track. And what's really sad is that some of the, some films that people just absolutely love had no temp track when there was, Killer Clowns did not have a temp track at all, except for the uh, the Dickies, Dickies opening theme song. Right, didn't right. Have, didn't have any music within the whole score, within the whole movie. Um, and uh, there are other movies that are very innovative that were, uh, edit, the, the editorial process was to story pacing, getting the right. story paced out properly, not having to worry about beats and stuff like that. Um, right. So uh, I did a Western uh, for uh, like a year ago for um, Josh Becker. Uh, he's a director and producer. He works with Sam Raimi a lot. And mm -hmm. he didn't temp track. He says, he says, by the way, we don't use temp tracks. This is the type of film that I want, you know. And he explained it to me. And that's all he needed to do. And I just commit, commenced from so there. Do you, do you prefer then if they don't? Well, if they do, it has to be a specific reason why they're, they're using something. And it's just, for me, for me, it was just to give a flavor. Because if you start copying things, it, what, what we start to have is like a homogenization of film music. So right. 
like, let's say someone, let's say, okay, let's say, for instance, a movie that I really love, um, uh, uh, Arrival with uh, Johannes Johansson. Uh, uh -huh. Johan Johansson. And let's say they temp track that with the score from Alien, right? Okay. You would look at the movie and you say, oh, well, the music sounds like it's from Alien. Instead of like, wow, this music seems like from another dimension. You know yeah, what I'm right. saying? Yeah, so yeah. That, that's a good example. You know, yeah. how, you know, how would have uh, the movie uh, Arrival, if you're familiar with that film, how would it have looked if it, they temp tracked the whole thing with Alien? So, right. So no, I, 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 think, I think it's important to, that the music give a film a, a very unique signature. Yeah, I think that um, it's almost it encourages your your like real creativity to yeah. be able to for them not to as well. But, you know the the movies of uh, old that kind of like hold true to you know collectors or film enthusiasts that you know they'll go back to and they'll point to the score of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's all you guys just getting to sit down and write music versus right. a temp track. That's you guys, the true collaboration, I guess, mm -hmm. so to speak. I, I will fully admit that I um, use music as models. I'll hear a piece of music that I like. Maybe I like not necessarily the notes, but the form of what it does. Like, oh, wow, this music is, is tooling along at this pace, and then bam, there's a complete different uh, texture put in there uh, that sh completely changes everything. So that concept will work its way into whatever I'm creating. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's not like, oh, wait, let me see, what chord did they use? I'll use similar chords and I'll come in with a similar chord. No, it's basically the form and structure. So that that's always, uh, that's always helpful. Um, yeah. You know, to have maybe a model, something to give you, uh, that, that would be a fall under influence. So, We had a, a kind of a cool question. When creating music, mm -hmm. did you know what kind of tone you wanted to set right from the get-go mm -hmm. uh, as far as scary or comedic comedy uh -huh. points? Did you always, like, when you sit down to write a piece, do you always know this is going to be dark or this is going to be more lighthearted or does it kind of develop into something else along the way? Well, since we're talking about killer clowns, uh, I, I will say that uh, the, the, the music is like a, a straight man, so to speak. <laughs> so uh, let's pick a scene uh, where, uh, gosh, it, I just know that it's in the seventh reel. <laughs> <laughs> it's like toward the end of the movie, you know, as we're winding up the movie uh, to yeah. the final climax where the clowns are marching through the screen uh, the streets vacuuming people up i knew immediately that i wanted to do something serious mm -hmm. and uh, my motivation was like say okay let's let's substitute the town with uh, a village in world war ii and let's substitute the killer clowns with uh, a you know a panzer division right just bowling through the streets and everyone just sitting around looking hopeless you know, right, right, right. so you have this like kind of hideous uh, uh, military march going on, and it plays well. And I'm sure I, I've I've since recorded it with an orchestra. And you could probably play that music up against something else in, mm -hmm. it, with a similar style, some kind of invasion thing, and it, it it might might work just right. as well. Right. So, so it has a universal kind of appeal. Gotcha. So, uh, so things like that. So my approach was, you know, you know, the, cl you know, the clowns, you, you could, I think you could, with a silly music score, I think you could potentially m make the movie less uh, uh, um, effective, you know. Um, I mean, we can go back to examples like we all now, we all know now because there's documentaries of it, the very first Star Wars in its original director's cut had lots of problems. And uh, people came in with suggestions on how to cut the film, how to trim the story, how to re-juxtapose scenes, um, how to do some cheats, like with off-camera lines and what have you, and also with music. Can you imagine if it was just in its original form, what it right. would be like? Would it have been just a, a fun little movie that, that was a one-time thing, and maybe they did one continuation of the story? What they did is they really locked down the form of that 
film. And um, that's where you go back to the collaborative process. You know, if George Lucas says, no, it's going to stay exactly the way I, every frame has got to be exactly the way it may not have worked. I mean, because he had some heavy hitters. He had Steven Spielberg, Brian De Palma, Martin Scorsese telling him what's not working with his film. Right. And he was very, you know, and that's what I like. I have friends that I will send stuff to. There are other composers and, and they're giving me, they're giving me critique, not for, for the specific reason, because they want me to look good. They want it to be whatever it is. They go, I, I see what you're trying to do. I think you should cut out this one part. This part, this, this music that's at the end, that could be your introduction. And I go, well, that's, I never thought of that. That's a good idea. You know, so, uh, and this has happened through history. The composers have, throughout history, have played their music to other composers. Contrary to popular belief, Salieri and Mozart were actually very well acquainted with each other and very much appreciated each other's work, not as it was portrayed in the movie. Salieri was actually a very, very uh, sought after composer uh, for, uh, for other composers to study from. Uh, he, he, one of his students were uh, Franz Liszt and uh, Beethoven for crying out loud. And um, he went to, he, both Mozart and Salieri went to each other's performances and had comment. So, um, you know, the, the, the whole thing of locking yourself in a room and not talking to people and coming up with your, your master work is a good, is a start, but you have to, you gotta be able to take uh, criticism. And one more thing about the film, uh, film music. I think we take it for granted <laughs> because when we watch a movie, let's say a dramatic, uh, a narrative drama, and we hear music, we take it for granted that it's there. But we yeah. need it. It's that one yeah. element that um, uh, uh, kind of um, <clears throat> reaches out uh, and, and helps to uh, interpret the story in emotional terms through music. Right. I mean, basically, I mean, because in reality, you know, when you're walking down the street, you're not hearing music. It's kind of when you think about it, it's kind of unnatural. And there was a time in early films where uh movie producers this is like in silent film or when sound started to come in um they said listen the, the only reason why you should have music is if we see a musician on stage uh, on the camera otherwise it's silly to have music playing and then they realized no we, we need that i mean that's you know it worked with opera it works with uh uh, uh drama on uh stage dramas it's going to work with film and thankfully uh we have film music to help us uh, relive um, the experience of whatever movie we love uh, through music yeah. or afterwards. Yeah. Uh, Andrew asked, were you a fan of the clowns before you started work on the movie or did you get to see them before you started work? And are you still, I think the answer to this is obviously yes, a fan of them now. I know, uh, you always seem like you have some of the coolest killer clown stuff <laughs> like you get like the uh um the the concert when you guys were doing the the killer clowns in concert to have the guys in the full costumes right or because i know you guys were doing your thing before they came to halloween horror nights right right so to, be, well, to see someone in those costumes made me super jealous i wanted that picture right well you have to understand the kyoto brothers were, were very involved in the uh exhibition of the live to film concert so mm -hmm. uh, we also had uh grant kramer and suzanne snyder there and steve directed a uh they kind of did a, a reenactment of the scene where they first come to the uh they come see the, uh, uh, they're in the spaceship and they, they see the first cotton candy cocoon. So Steve yeah. choreographed all of that. And that was really cool. We had some uh, music playing in the background. This is before the concert started. And all the costume guys are from Steve, the Kyoto Brothers people. I mean, yeah. basically I told him, is there any, you know, is there any way we can get someone in the clown suit? Oh gosh, let, let, me, let me put the call out. So there's, I yeah. think there are, five official Kyoto brother uh, uh, get ups with uh, the the masks and the uniform uh, the whole yeah, right. the whole the whole thing the guy yeah. that plays the killer um, uh, it, it, it's um, Andrew McGregor and he uh, he's like six foot seven 
giant guy. He plays in yeah. Highland games and stuff like that. He's also an entrepreneur and does a lot of uh, um, uh, appearances around the world. And uh, he uh, he was he's a great guy to have around. So he was like the big tall guy. He's actually that tall. He wasn't on stilts or anything. So. Um, uh, so the Kyoto brothers were there. There's also Buster Balloon Cadwell was there. There was uh, there were various circus performers that did not perform, but they came dressed as the clown, um, clown, clown themed circus uh, garb to kind of add to the uh, uh, atmosphere. But yeah, that that's all from the Kyoto brothers. They have that's, that. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, Ashley is asking, what was the most difficult song to compose for the movie? Like, is there a song that you have a love hate relationship with? Well, that's a very good uh, question, Ashley. Uh, you know, I work through that. In other words, if there's a piece of music I don't like, um, now have there been pieces of music that for time I go, listen, this is the best I could do. I know if I had like two more days, this would be perfect. And it's in some movie. Thankfully, it's not in a movie that uh, I see all the time or I have to be reminded of it. Right. Um, but for Killer Clowns, the only thing that I would say was a challenge was the very end scene where, you know, um, Dave uh, takes his pin, uh, badge off and he blows up and he, he, he right. pops the, the nose of Clownzilla in an explosion. That whole sequence for the last, I'd say min two minutes of that sequence was really tough. And the reason why it was tough, because something was distracting me. Uh, one of the Kyoto brothers had just gotten married, or was get about to get married. He was having a big party that I got invited to. And I had to show up at seven o'clock to be on a truck, a, a bus, to go to the different venues. They were going to go bar hopping and then come back to the studio and have a big old party, right? Yeah. And, I, and and at around five o'clock, six o'clock, I was getting, I, was, well, I should be getting ready to leave. This isn't looking good. And I had a recording session the next day. So I had to have it ready, right? Yeah. And so I just said, you know, I'm just, I'll, I'll go, I'll go when I'm ready. I'll just meet him back at the studio. So I f had a sacrifice going to the party, which is really good because I got to put in that extra seven hours to make it just right. Everything timed out perfectly. Everything yeah, yeah. built up just right. Because I know that if I, as is, if I let it go and get recorded, I'd be editing to this day, I'd be trying to recreate it and edit it. So yeah. I could, it's always good to approach something with 100% commitment. That way, years later when you hear it, it just plays to you as a piece of music, not as a regret. And you can you can enjoy it instead of um, be haunted by it. So yeah. that's a good answer for you. Yeah, no, that was that's cool. Um, Charles asks, uh, you've composed for such a wide variety of scores, from themes to American Pickers to Twenty Four to your recent work on a virtual reality film about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, what is your creative process like for such different projects? Well, each project is its own world. So you kind of basically get immersed into that world that you're, um, uh, that you're going to be involved with because any kind of, any film has a, a backstory, Jimmy, you know, I mean, people just don't, you know, when a show a movie comes well nowadays not just in theaters but shows up on netflix you're looking at like three to four maybe five years prior to when it aired uh the preparation uh right all the preparation yeah. goes into it and finally it's ready it's you know it's not like an episodic television where they have everything set up they have the story and the characters it's just a, a matter of shooting it editing it putting it in the machine getting it out right so uh, each one of those films, you you become close to the creators. You, you you get acquainted with the people who are creating it, get as much input from them, and get what I call, you get religion. You get into the spirit of whatever you're working on. Right. Uh, I'll say for, let me just say for American Pickers, that's a different process. That's, um, uh, there's, a, there's a large body of music that I've created that's licensed, that appears everywhere. I mean, there's, uh, 
It might show up in American Pickers. It might show up in a movie trailer for Toy Story. It might sh show up as a um, uh, coming attractions for something on uh, the Disney Network or Disney Plus, or, or for. Oh, you like did like a like a portfolio thing, like you mm -hmm. just like made your own like package. Yeah, yeah, I have like a lot of music that I've created. As a matter of fact, I'm working on something now in, under in a similar uh, vein. And there's a company called Extreme Music uh, that I work with. That and there's a few others, but Extreme Music is particular to pick American Pickers and a variety. I mean, count almost countless uh, television shows on that are streaming. Um, and it's a company that's uh, was founded by. Um, uh, Hans Zimmer and his uh, his associates, and basically, you know, there's this great music lying around that we do on various projects. We should use it. It should be available for uh, the media industry to to work into their work into their programming. So that's where some of that. That's where American Pickers comes from. That's kind of like real estate. It's like you prepared a piece of property, a piece of music that's licensed and used in a variety of, of venues. But uh, for the story of Jesus Christ, uh, there was some friends of mine uh, that they work out of Universal Studios. And they had this uh, project for a virtual reality movie that we might develop into something else. Um, yeah. Because I don't know, we no one really knows where the virtual reality uh, uh, format is going. Um, so uh, basically, I worked on that for three months, and uh, we went through a process. Again, we went through a process where they they started putting in music, and I said no, let's. And then they said, you know, this isn't working. The, the even the temp music isn't working. Let's come up with something from scratch that works with only with our film. That's be, that when people hear it'll. It, they'll recognize it as being from our film. So, yeah. uh, so it's a matter of um, just being, you know, being part of the program, you know, being a, a good team player and, and being aware of what, what people are trying to communicate. And then you express that musically. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, that was a, I feel like that was an awesome answer. Yeah. Is there a, uh, or, that you prefer most outside of Killer Clowns from Outer Space that you've gotten to compose? Well, um, I've done a variety of things. Uh, way back when, I, I didn't compose the score, but I was the music director and orchestrator and conductor for a horror movie called, um, oh, I don't know if it's a horror movie, a ghost story. Maybe it's a horror movie. It had, it had a lot of horror elements in it, I suppose. It was Lady in White. Um, was one, um, and there's numerous ones. I'm losing track of them all, but uh, the other the other day, someone went through my IMDb and pulled out all the projects I've done that have a horror horror theme to it, and I was amazed. Um, there's a lot of music that I've done that's been licensed out uh, yeah. that found found its way in um, uh, streaming uh, TV series that are horror themed, like. Um, ghost whisperer or my haunted house and uh you know those are kind of I guess reality shows i did a video game based on paranormal uh paranormal uh activity um and um there's the cell the sequel to the cell i did that yeah. um let me see there's one called ring around the rosy it's a uh psycho psychodrama psycho psychological drama and um but I would like to do some more. I, th I think uh, I think I'm ready to to hit to hit something that hard and serious. You know, uh, horror is a very very specific. It's almost like comedy. It can be very hard. Uh, comedy is a, a very difficult genre to pull off well. And genre the same thing. I just saw I just saw Sinister, uh, and Scott Derrickson is a director that I'm, I'm familiar with, and the composer. Christopher Young, which I'm very familiar with. We went to uh, UCLA at uh, uh, just back to back, uh, you know, so I, we've known each other over the years. And that sinister is a brilliantly conceived story and script and the score equally so. Uh, so I'm wait, I would, I would love to get with a serious horror director that has a wonderful script that, uh, that uh, is really passionate about it and work on a, a new horror movie. That kind of leads into uh, the next question, 
perfectly. Uh, Andrew's asking, is there a specific person, group, or property, we'll say, mm -hmm. that you would uh, kind of be like the dream property for you to compose? Well, I listen, if I can work with a director like Scott Derrickson or someone in that in that league, someone that's that's got a has keen storytelling um, uh, talents, because uh, Scott Der Derrickson also wrote that script. And uh, what's great about watching a movie with a great script is that you don't know you're watching a movie. You're, you're in an experience. So um, it would be that just to work with someone who's very, very talented. You know, there's not a like, do I want to do the next it series? No, it's I don't think that way. I mean, if I got the call for it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if uh, I mean, I did get last year, they I was contacted to license some of my my own original music directly from the wonderful people at um, at um, uh, that Netflix series that we all love called Stranger Things. You know, uh, do I see myself doing episodes of Stranger Things? I mean, sure, if I had called, I would love to work on it, but it's not what I'm going to, like, work toward, uh, you know, because right. it's, it's already helmed by two really good composers that have a really, they've got a lock on the philosophy of right. the movie as it relates to music. So that's that's done. Um, but uh, there's, I, I get invited to work on movies. I worked on a movie with uh, uh, Bear McCreary. Uh, hmm. I think it was about a year ago, year and a half ago. It was called Hellfest, basically like a hmm. Halloween yeah. horror nights, but with yeah, no, yeah, the movie right. through it, right? You know, so uh, and it was so funny. He says, "You know what? I've been I've been messing with this movie for several months. I keep talking about the Killer Clowns guy, and I keep telling him I know the Killer Clowns guy. I'm friends with the Killer Clowns guy. So since you're the Killer Clowns guy, do you want to uh, you know come in on this and?" have a blast and, and that's exactly what happened we had an absolute blast um a good uh last question i was gonna ask try to uh get some info but dawson seems like he's similar minded uh there's rumors there was heavy rumors of some kind of a uh, epilogue or sequel movie to the killer clown story I know when Disney kind of like bought Fox that killed some of the rumors as far as a, a sequel, but who knows? Um, there's a killer clown in that new mm -hmm. Disney plus show prop culture. Right. That's in the guy's collection. Disney didn't edit out the killer clown. The killer clown is loud and proud in the background in the show. So Disney's obviously okay. Kind of having the, the the image of killer clowns from outer space and something maybe somewhere in some universe at some point we still get a killer clown sequel mm -hmm. if we ever do i would have to imagine uh they they propose you come back and do the music for it are you game to continue the killer clown story well brace yourself children take a sip don't do this. Get, get ready for the ride. Here it is. Here, here's you're gonna hear it. This is what I can tell you. This is what Uncle John can tell you. Uh, as far as the whole Disney Fox connect, connection goes, I have no idea what that's about. I honestly, to me, that sounds. Uh, I I just I just shrug my shoulders. I can tell you this: that the intellectual property is owned by Metro Golden Mayor MGM. And um, so that's all I can tell you is that they own the property. As far as any development that will happen, it will happen through them. Uh, it will happen via them or it will be licensed from them. And we've seen that in the licensing of the intellectual property for two Universal Studios for Halloween Horror Nights. Right. So, um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, it would be logical that if someone was was very enthusiastic about seeing a sequel, you would contact the corporate website of MGM. They have a contact number and they have an email, a, a, a dot info, info or whatever, and I'm sure you can express it to them. I unfortunately don't have any pull unless I wanted it when I do a concert, 
which I have to, I have just like everyone else, uh, just like when I did my reimagined soundtrack album, it has to go through, it has to meet their approval. So right. and, uh, as far as, um, uh, you know, the same thing with the Kyoto Brothers, even if the Kyoto Brothers themselves want to do something that requires uh, approval, they have to go through you, uh, MGM. It, what's fascinating is that, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think Universal Studios owned um, the property of Killer Clowns, like in the 90s, if I'm not mistaken. I think they, I think they did their yeah. for, with, for I, And I only know this because I uh, did my research in the 90s because I wanted to do a sound, an, an alternative soundtrack way back then, and I was in contact via mail, like actually pieces of paper that you send like even though i lived right across the street from universal studios i mailed a uh, request uh for to do a soundtrack it was to universal so it was like in 1999 uh mgm ran with it with the first release of a dvd and we did some uh bonus features uh, uh or what, what, what did they call them they called bonus features they're called um uh extra features or yeah extra you know uh behind the scenes yeah whatever. behind the scenes stuff you know uh so that's all i can say is that I, I wish i had more information for you than that um you know keep your uh, keep your eyes open um I would but, say but I, I can't say anything about the whole 20th century Fox disney thing i mean in a fantasy world i would say if disney owned killer clowns from outer space i could see um california adventure next to um uh, <laughs> next to it's some place there's going to be a little ca carnival circus yeah, yeah you know, but, sure. but but that's in a fantasy world because uh that's may or may not happen because uh mgm is the property holder of that so no one can hope that would be that'd that be would possible. be interesting john <laughs> uh, i thank you for thank you time to be our guest and i thank you guys for all watching john's panel we will be back on the hour at one o'clock with another panel but john thank you man very much thank you jimmy kicking our day off right man thank you we appreciate and it give my regards to the crew can i give a shout out to the crew brian yeah. brian charlie and uh andrew thanks thank man you. and